Welcome to the broadcast, my darling fruit. It's lovely to see you, and it was a joy to see Catherine yesterday at the National Portrait Gallery, wasn't it? She looked so exquisite, and I absolutely loved that white boucle tweedy number. She was wearing the jacket with white, with black trim, and then it was shot through with silver metallic thread. Wonderful. That is what really elevated it for me. Looked fabulous on her figure, and I even rather enjoyed the pleated skirt or dress that was underneath it. Lovely, because pleats can be a little bit, how do I put it, mumsy. They can come across a little mumsy, but she carried it off with a plum. And I love the way that it swishes in the light. That's the thing I like about pleats. They, the light bounces off of them and you get that sense of movement and a bit of swishy-wishy. Wonderful it was, swishy on the tushy. The hair was teased and coiffed to perfection. Sometimes it's a little bit too perfect, you can tell she's been there with the old uh, Dyson Air app, making sure those loose curls at the bottom are tumbling just right. She is just almost too perfect, isn't she, that girl? But I say almost because I wouldn't have her any other way. I love our future queen, showing everybody how it's done. She showed Sir Paul McCartney, who was also in attendance because the National Portrait Gallery, which was reopened after a three-year restoration project, is playing host to a new Beatles exhibition. So she had a lovely chat with Sir Paul and his wife, Nancy, and they got on very well and had a good old chuckle. And she took the time to view new acquisitions from the gallery, and she visited the Pally Learning Centre, and you saw her talking with mothers and children and parents. And she also got to speak with Tracy Emin, who is the one that designed the new doors for the gallery. And it is a work of art incorporating 45 panels of brass to represent every woman throughout time. And while the Princess of Wales was busy at the National Portrait Gallery, her in-laws, the King and Queen, made their royal entrance at Royal Ascot. And the Queen was wearing the late Queen Mother's brooch, the Corto Tomel brooch. Yes, and you've seen this brooch before, if you've been eagle-eyed. It was one that the Queen Mother wore on her 100th birthday, amongst other occasions, and also the late Queen used to wear it. You'll have seen this shell shape made of rows of diamonds with a single solitary pearl. No, it's not you, Megu, the girl with the pearl. No. Then there are several diamond strands dangling underneath, glistening. Wonderful. She was wearing a cream outfit with matching hat. I must admit, I didn't really like the cut of the coat. I didn't really like the cut of it. It didn't flatter her as some others do, but it wasn't hideous. <laughs> My dears, I'm just popping in on Wednesday as this is going out today. It was recorded yesterday, and at the time of recording, I had no idea or no clue that this piece was by Dior. <laughs> you couldn't make it up, could you? It was by Dior, and the press are having a field day. <laughs> oh, the shade, the shade. Well, listen, I stand by what I said. I'm going to stand by my critique, despite it being made by such an esteemed Atelier, I'm going to stand by my critique. I don't really think it did her any favours. There, I said it. There, I said it. But I'm sure it's an exquisite piece, and all the reviews say that it is very exquisitely done and handmade with lots of lovely detail. Well, I wasn't that fond of the colour or the shape on our Queen. I think there are different cuts that can do better. And I thought the same when I saw the Dior suit on Harry uh, during the coronation. So it is what it is take that or leave it, but there have been some delicious commentaries in the newspapers and online and on Twitter people are having a field day over this and the apparent shade thrown towards Megan to put her in her place. Well, I can tell you this design was chosen weeks ago, selected weeks ago. The Queen and the King are not bothered with those kind of machinations. They are not coming in with some sort of petty display of rivalry because they don't need to rival anybody. They are their majesties, king and queen. So I'll say that for what it's worth, but it doesn't stop it being rather a delicious moment of pie in the eye, doesn't it, my fruits? <laughs> the king was traditional in grey morning suit, double-breasted waistcoat and a topper, and there was a tie pin. That was the wonderful bling-bling feature 
with a silver crown in amongst it and a sapphire gem and other diamonds. A nice little touch there. And he was very kissy kissy with niece Zara, who was wearing lovely watery greens and apricots. I liked the colour, but I did not like the button up affair. Button up, button down. I know it's easy access for Mickey boy, but I didn't enjoy it. But she still looked wonderful because she always looks wonderful. But it was kissy, kissy, kissy. And the Queen got a nice nibble on the neck from Mickey as well. Lucky Camilla, yes. Princess Beatrice was seen in a floral gown by Balula. And of course, a gigantic pink silk headband. Absolutely humongous, that thing. I did like the gown though because I like those floral patterns. I think it's rather sophisticated. The Princess Royal was given the opportunity to wriggle out of her uniform and plume, which she's seen so much of her in of late, and shimmy into something a little bit more feminine for the occasion. And the blue gloves, and it's a look we've seen before but is always very welcome, and it was also very nice to see Tommy Parker Bowles having some fun with the King and the Queen. In fact, all of them were enjoying themselves. It was a real sense of gaiety on this lovely Summer's Day Royal Ascot. They deserve a bit of fun to grasp it where they can because they've been working so very hard. And as you might have seen the day before yesterday, many members of the royal family congregated together at Windsor Castle to celebrate the oldest and most senior order of chivalry during a colourful event full of history and pageantry. This is the Order of the Garter, established by King Edward III nearly 700 years ago, who was so inspired by tales of King Arthur and the chivalry of the Knights of the Round Table that he set up his own group of honourable knights. And the knights processed in grand velvet robes, glistening insignia and plumed hats. Catherine was our polka dot princess with matching hat by Philip Tracy. She wore Diana's Collingwood drop pearl earrings and white high heels dipped in a glossy black. And I heartily approved of her updo, which was beautifully realised. I also forgot to flash up a photograph of Catherine from behind at Trooping the Colour the other day. So just in case you missed it, there was this lovely photograph taken from behind, which sounds a little naughty, but not for any naughty reasons, simply because it was a wonderful shape. It was a wonderful detail to the back of the hat as well, which shouldn't have gone unnoticed. There were over 3,000 members of the public, cheering, cheering, many smiles, plenty sunshine, and one fainting. Under her blue velvet mantle, Her Majesty wore a gown by good old faithful Brucie Oldfield. Yes, she did. The Duchess of Edinburgh was a joy to see. Yes, that floral print dress with the bright pinks did grab my heart. I've got to tell you, it did that symphony of bright pink flowers. I loved its charm. I did, but I do have a pompous side, my dear. As you know, I do have a stuffy pompous side and... Uh, Call it a love of tradition, if you will, but I, I would have preferred a three-quarter length sleeve on that gown for the occasion. It's a lovely dress. It's a lovely dress, but I don't want to see the arms at a royal event, especially one within a chapel. No. And I'm afraid to say that when it comes to the hat, I didn't notice initially from the first few seconds of watching. I thought they went together all right, but then as the camera zoomed in and I saw photographs, I realised that it didn't match at all. And this seems to be... A frequent habit of Sophie over the past year to pair a hat that bears no resemblance to the colours in the gown. I'm not saying they have to match exactly, of course not, my dear, but it seems a little incongruous to have red and blue here and then green and pink and white here. I'm sure a better match could have been made. I don't know what you think. The same style would have been wonderful, but reflecting some of the same colours of the, the gown in some way. Maybe I'm going over the top. Maybe I'm demanding too much. But I just don't understand. I don't understand. But it was an Amelia Wickstead dress. I did love it. And the hat was by Jane Taylor. And even though I have no great desire to watch the entire thing unfold, I've got better things to do with my time. You know, I did catch some glimpses of them all walking past in their fineries and velvet gowns and drapes. And yes. I've got to tell you, it brings out such fondness in me for the traditions, for seeing everything trussed up, and yes, I will say it dragged up, as I've said before. Drag can give meaning to life, and 
If you're in denial about the fact that it is a form of drag, well, that's up to you, my dear. But for many of us, we are born naked and the rest is drag. And that is what brings out the juice and the fun in life. Would be would be all be watching them progress in the same way if they were wearing blue denim jeans and white shirts getting about their business? No, we want the colour, we want the metallics, the glints and golds. Uh, and what could be viewed as rather silliness or stuffiness, whatever you want to call it. It's all just fabulous, isn't it? Really fabulous. And it makes me feel fond and affectionate and nostalgic and everything all together. And it does for me make sense in 2023. It does. It still makes sense in a sort of timeless way. In fact, it makes more sense than a lot of so-called modern things that I see out there. It just strikes one right under the left tit. And guess who was trotting around Mayfair, my fruits? Trotting around Mayfair. Popping into Lulu's, Lulu's. No, not Fergie. No, not Eugenie or Beatrice. No, my dear. It was the prince and princess. Michael of Kent. Yes, it was. So fun to see them out and about having a fabulous time. They were sneaking out of Lulu's they were and into a waiting car that the princess was driving herself. She requires no chauffeur. She could dismiss them, do her bidding alone. Yes, at 78 years old, she was a vision in oversized cream and silver white. Very nice. But Prince Michael of Kent won first prize, really because he looked so dapper, so debonair, light brown trousers, a pink shirt and a pocket square. And I thought he looked heavenly, really dashing, a handsome winter season for the prince. And they were accompanied by another lady in florals. And if the three of them, looking cosy as they did, trotted back to Kensington Palace to enjoy a menage a trois, or some sort of arrangement between the three of them, so what? What business is it of mine and what business is it of yours? It is their arrangement to, to orchestrate as they wish and to their pleasure. So good on them, I see. Whether or not they did <laughs> is a question for the Michaels and this lady in the florals. But they know how to have fun. They really do. And remember, as Harry tells us in Spare, he was their neighbour. He was their basement dwelling lurking uh, puffing neighbour. Uh, they had to put up with him. Now, so they deserve a bit of fun now and a bit of pleasure, don't they? Now that they've been released from those terrors of Kensington Palace. Now we must turn to the subject of Harry, because he's been facing further criticism. A retired army colonel of over 30 years experience, military intelligence officer, who led the US European Command Intelligence Engagement Division for two years, well, he's been speaking out, this Jonathan Sweet, he was interviewed for The Hill out of Washington, D.C., and he was speaking about Harry's comments at trial a couple of weeks ago, where he said that the British government has hit rock bottom. Yes, he spoke out with a detrimental opinion on the British government. Now, I might agree with him on the fact that the British government are nothing to be proud of at this moment in time, although I will say and this isn't really in relation to any of his policies or his politics, but I will say I actually enjoy having what appears to be an adult back in the room, a grown-up back in the room. At least Rishi Sunak feels like we are, you know, dealing with a man rather than a man-baby. I might agree with Harry about what he says about the state of government. I might not, but it was still ridiculously unthoughtful and uncaring to come out with the criticism he did for His Majesty's government. It is his father's government. And whether or not he's still working for his father, there's something called family loyalty and having a bit of dignity. Well, this retired army colonel said, Harry has just breached an inviolate British convention whereby the royal family remains above and apart from the fray of domestic politics. He clearly has no grasp of the gravity and responsibility of the affairs of state, or if he does, 
then he clearly does not care how his words and actions in pursuit of personal goals and vendettas actively undermine the national well-being and security of the country of his birth. I agree with Jonathan Sweet, and I know many of you do as well, and it's important to read out for those that don't understand. He said, Harry is undermining the sacrosanct equivalent of a US separation of powers wherein the royal family does not involve itself in the workings of His Majesty's government. This understood separation of powers is the bedrock of the relationship, not only between king and parliament, but between king and country as well. Hear, hear. Kelly Osborne is the other one that waded in, and she came out with a furious, furious tirade, peppered with expletives, which I'm not going to read out during this particular broadcast. You can use your imagination. This is an Osborne we're talking about. She said he was whinging and whining, and she spoke in no uncertain terms about it. Everybody's life is hard, she says. She says he is a complaining, woe is me type. I'm the only one who had mental problems. My life was so hard. Everybody's life was hard, she says. Everybody's life is hard. She says, you are the prince of a country who dressed up as a Nazi, and now you're trying to come back as the Pope. No, no. Well, you are not alone in your criticism, Kelly Osborne. You are not alone. But William was alone yesterday. He was out and about without his wife. He was meeting with lionesses. Yes, he was meeting some other gals. England's women's football team, because he is president of the FA, the Football Association, and this was at the training ground. He met with the team ahead of their travel to Australia for the World Cup. He played table football with them and gave them a pep talk, and there was much gaiety. And wasn't the photograph of Prince William for Father's Day really lovely? Those children adore him, don't they? Adore him. But it really was very well captured by Millie Pilkington at Windsor. All in blue, 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 blue. It's definitely the reign of the blue. And he's been speaking out. He did a big interview for the Times, the English paper, the Times. I want to end homelessness in Britain. We all know this is one of his great passions. And he's going to be launching a really big project this month from their Royal Foundation. And I've noticed, as you might have done, the press have begun pitching Charles and William against each other. I sense that this is coming. <laughs> They've had their fun with Harry. Now they want to add a little bit of tension between Charles and William. Suggestions of tension coming up because of the timing of this photograph's release, because on Sunday all the front pages were William and Father's Day and his homelessness project and the repercussions from all of that. And what the suggestions have been in various headlines is that there were raised eyebrows at the palace over breakfast on Sunday when they saw these headlines because it took attention away from tripping the colour on the Saturday. Well, I mean, this is really pushing it. First of all, as we all know, the king, for example, has had 74 years experience of tabloid newspapers. He understands that he's not always going to be front page, just as the late Elizabeth understood that the younger ones would often come and take the headlines from her. Charles, as Harry tells us himself, doesn't even really take much time to look over the tabloids at the breakfast table while he, while the Duke and Duchess of Sussex were pouring all over them and going through the comment sections online. Well, the King and Queen have got better things to do, like hoe the weeds down and, you know, hose down the garden, this kind of thing. Better things to do, my love. But you're going to see this kind of mischief coming from the press, mark my words. And just to remind you, one of the most vulgar phrases, well, they were all vulgar, but one from Harry's tone was, pa, and, and you, beggar's belief he would allow J.R. Murringer to put this out there in this form, pa and Camilla didn't like Willie and Kate drawing attention away from them or their causes. They'd openly scolded Willie about it many times. Can you believe that a prince of the United Kingdom conjured up this muck. But anyway, it sings like this, which set the cat amongst the pigeons, doesn't it? And set up the tabloid media 
to go gunning for William and Charles and their relationship. So as much as Harold is taking the press to trial and making a great big zippity doo dah out of the whole affair, he's the one that's setting up his kinfolk for the same sort of miseries and the same sort of scrutiny. Parr and Camilla didn't like Willie and Kate drawing attention. They openly scolded Willie about it many times. Oh, I'm sorry. You can just imagine Queen Camilla, can't you? Having a go at William and getting away with it? I don't think so, my dear. I really don't think so. I'm not sure who raised their eyebrows at the palace, but I very much doubt it was either the king's or the queen's when this came through. And exactly how is William supposed to re-engineer Father's Day? It falls on Sunday, or it fell on Sunday the 18th of June here in the kingdom. What was he supposed to do? Twist time, release Father's Day photos on another day. Everybody knows that the nation enjoys seeing their Father's Day and Mother's Day pictures as heir to a future king. So what's he supposed to do? Wait until Monday and say, oh, sorry, it's late. Then everyone will complain. And also, look at the scheduling. Saturday was Trooping the Colour. Sunday, was William's interview and his Father's Day photograph. Then Monday was Garter Day, which features the King and the Queen as well. And no, the King and Queen for the birthday parade weren't featured heavily on Sunday's papers. But guess what? This isn't 1983. We are in the modern digital age. And by Sunday morning, the whole Trooping the Colour story had done the rounds online in the 24-7 hour news cycle. So it, did, it wouldn't have mattered if William had released a photograph or not. They would have rustled up new news for Sunday morning anyway, and Charles and Camilla wouldn't have appeared. But then you have dedicated royal publications, or royal favoured, how can I put it, uh, publications with the royal bent, such as Hello magazine, for example. They do feature the King and Queen on their cover for a weekly edition. So it has wings for the entire week, will be seen in our supermarkets, grocery stores for an entire week. So there are all those practicalities to take into consideration. Also take into consideration the fact that perhaps Buckingham Palace and Kensington Palace don't see themselves as such cutthroat competitors that they're going to make much of a meal over which which of the two makes the front page because they're all really working towards the same cause, aren't they? So I just mention this in order to encourage you to watch out for this kind of mischief because I'm sure it will be incoming. Thanks to you know who. William revealed his plans to build social housing on his private estate, the Duchy of Cornwall, inherited from his father. And this is a 130,000 acre empire, a property empire. And he says that the key thing about this social housing endeavour is making this sustainable. He wants to start very small and he says that we will all be seeing it when it is ready and not before. He is taking his time and if it's effective he will increase the amount of social housing that is available. So it'll be trialled. He says it's all very well doing big gestures but there's no point if there's no future to it. He's methodical about these enterprises. He says he wants to make a difference to homelessness, but not set them up for another fall or give them false hope because he's seen it all before. They've seen it all before and he doesn't want to add to that sort of cacophony. If he's going to do it, he wants to do it right. He also says that he wants to be an umbrella for various homelessness projects such as the passage. Such is going to go out of my mind now. What's the main one? Centre point. And there was a third one that he mentioned as well, but you know, I, I'm gone with the wind, my dear. He can act as an umbrella point to focus them all, harness all their energy towards this particular goal that he's got in mind. Not just the social housing, but this other project to be revealed as it comes. So that's exciting in its way because hopefully it will go on to be a lifelong legacy that makes a real difference to homelessness. We shall see what he comes up with. We shall see. And just because I quite miss finishing on 
Princess Eugenie's maternity wear and what she was coming out with. We just have a few seconds to look at Princess Beatrice, who was spotted gulping water in this pretty frock. I do actually like the frock. She was tending to little Sienna for much of it and chatting to a friend. I like the look. I think the hair is handsome. I like it sort of scraped back like that. Very nice. I like the dress, but I am not a fan of the Gucci footwear. I am not a fan, Beatrice. Why? She's above that kind of thing. Only footmen wear the crests of other families. My dear, only footmen. You can get away with a little logo here or there, even the Queen, you know, a little emblem, a little nod here and there. But that Gucci green, the G, anything that is just too immediately recognisable as a designer piece can be fun on the right person in the right circumstance. I'm not saying that I've never indulged in it at all, but generally speaking, there is a vulgarity to it. So I just say, choose your moment. And when you are a princess, there is never a moment like that. So reconsider my darling Beatrice. That is all I ask, reconsider. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me for our cozy chat. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you enjoyed the evening ahead. Do leave me a juicy comment and let me know what you thought of the royal wardrobe and all of these recent goings on. I find it interesting to hear your point of view. And my tip jar, if you wish to treat me to a cup of coffee or a slice of cake, is in the description box and I thank you most sincerely. I'll see you next time, my dears. Take care and toodle pip. Thank you.